We want to make sure you guys are fed and have a drink ready to go before we start at four. Thank you. pleasure to be with you all today. I'm supposed to stick to my notes, so I'm just going to make sure I do my job. Um, before we begin, I want to acknowledge the ancestral and traditional Aboriginal territories of the Comox First Nation of Vancouver Island, and I'd like to welcome Councillor Barb Mitchell to come forward and bring greetings. Barb, where are you? Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. This is really, really, truly a groundbreaking announcement happening today. And we're all very happy at uh, Comox. It's, you know, I can't express enough how much it's needed. So thank you to the funders. I'm here today on behalf of Comox people to welcome you all to Comox Traditional Territory. I hope you enjoy the news. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> So we are here to launch a very exciting project and this, this is a big deal I think for everyone in the room and so thank you for being with us to celebrate today. So we know that the Healing Childhood Trauma Partnership Program, which is such a great 
bundle of words put together and I've been really thinking about what does that actually mean for us and and I'm just going to say I just listened to Jan speak to um, the media and what really struck me and I just want to put this out there as we start this event is I want you to listen with your head and I want you to hear what we're doing uh, as part of this project but I actually really want you to listen with your heart today because this is actually a moment where we are going to change lives for children deeply because of this project. So I want you to listen with your head and I want you to listen with your heart today. So we want to recognize the power of partnership and collaboration. This is a program that would not happen without a collective group of organizations, professionals and experts coming together. And so I really want to acknowledge that collaboration and partnership is the essence of what this program is all about. So we have some fantastic people you're going to hear from today. My job is just to be your host and um, welcome you and introduce these amazing people. So we're going to hear from our board chair, Dean Freeman, from the Children's Health Foundation of Vancouver Island in a moment. Next, we're going to hear from Dr. Carol Coxon, psychiatrist from Comox, who will tell us about why it's important to address the growing issues of childhood trauma and mental health, and particularly at this young age that we know is so important. Finally, really honored, just met Dr. Bruce Perry and excited to hear from him about his work and how his work is being rolled out in this community, which I hope you all appreciate. And I know you will at the end of this um, event, how fortunate you are to have the expertise that you have in this community. It's amazing. So please join me in welcoming Dean Freeman, board chair of the Children's Health Foundation of Vancouver Island. Normally I don't like to use microphones, but uh, I have to listen to our CEO, or I'm driving back home with her to Victoria tonight, so she'll, uh, she might have a few words for me. Um, thank you, Diane. Appreciate the, uh, the comments. Um, I too also have a, a, a few written words, and I will stick to it. Um, but I want to say when, when, uh, when we got here today, uh, a few people came up and, and introduced themselves to me. And they told me what a great event there was this afternoon where they got to hear more about the project. I think there was 300 people that attended. But as these two specific ladies were talking to me, it was the energy that they were giving me. They were telling me how excited they are that this is here for the Comox Valley and for North Island. Um, so that, that's pretty exciting when, when immediately you have that energy coming back. You're saying, you know what, thank you. We think this is going to be such a huge impact for the island. So the, Vancouver, or the Children's Health Foundation of Vancouver Island has a long and proud history of supporting children and families across the island. In fact, we'll be celebrating our 90th anniversary this coming year. Throughout this time, the foundation has responded to the ever-changing needs of children, youth, and their families. As many of you know, we focus on supporting children and youth with disabilities and health challenges. Children's health needs are not static, and they change over the decades. For example, historic health challenges such as polio and TB no longer have the impact that they once did. But today, children and youth face many different and often more complex health challenges. And nowhere is this more evident than the growing, growing number of children and youth facing mental health challenges. From anxiety to depression to last, lasting impacts of brain injury or, as we'll hear about today, the enormous impact that trauma and neglect on children on children's health, we understand that mental, physical, and spiritual health are interconnected. Hardly a day goes by where we do not hear about a family whose lives have been impacted by mental health issues. When we speak to doctors, they tell us about families who are struggling to find their or struggling to find help for their children. When we speak to educators, they tell us about complex behavioral issues their teachers face in the classroom. And our community partners, whose staff are struggling to keep up with growing wait lists for counseling and other mental health supports. This is why I'm, I'm thrilled to be here today to launch such an exciting pilot project. One that will work to address mental health issues involving young children. Our support of the Healing Child Childhood Trauma Partnership Project, I think Diane said that a little better, is the largest single contribution that the Children's Health Foundation of Vancouver Island has ever made to a program in Central or North Island. We made this gift because we understand that as the Children's Health Foundation, we need to take a leadership role in supporting communities to address child and youth mental health issues. Now, I'm not going to try and explain what the pilot's all about, 
and I don't have to because we have the expert with us here today. Uh, so he's going to talk more about the, the uh, sorry, Dr. Bruce Berry is going to talk more about the, the work a little later. In the meantime, I want to acknowledge the great partnership that has made this project possible. I extend my heartfelt thanks to the Island Health, the Ministry of Child and Family Development, the Comox Valley Child Development Association, and School District 71 for their support and collaboration. I think it's also important that we thank uh, we send a special thank you to Dr. Carol Coxon and Jan Ferentz. This project was their vision and it's their passion and their commitment to children and their willingness to step outside of, of traditional models of therapy that inspired us to provide this support. Today we launch a pilot that will change the lives of local children. And today we begin a unique collaboration. And today we're going to take all that research and that knowledge and we're going to apply it practically right here in the Comox Valley and Port Hardy. And although I can't see into the future, it's my hope that this pilot, we're going to take this work and help other communities with the, with the, uh, the outcomes that come from this. So I want to thank you all for joining us this afternoon and we look forward to uh, uh, working with you on this and other exciting initiatives. Thank you. It's my pleasure now to welcome Dr. Carol Coxon. I am so looking forward to hearing from you. So Dr. Coxon is a child and adolescent psychiatrist practicing in Comox. Again, you guys are so lucky. And she's also at St. Joseph's General Hospital, does some consulting with the Ministry of Child and Family Development in Courtney, Campbell River, and Port Harvey. Dr. Coxon treats children and teenagers with mental health, including depression, anxiety, suicidal thinking, autism, psychosis, and problems stemming from trauma and neglect. What a job. Wow. I so admire you. Dr. Coxon, together with Jan Ferentz, have been dreaming about this project for many years, I understand. So please welcome Dr. Coxon to share her thoughts. Thank you. So I don't have a speech. I have nine words to keep me on track. <laughs> um, they have an expression in French um, called "c'est moi," meaning it's a short form for "c'est moi qui dois vous dire merci," which is my way of saying it's me that should be saying thank you very much to all these wonderful people that have helped this project get off the ground. I'd especially like to start with thanking the Children's Health Foundation of Vancouver Island. They have been incredibly generous and. Um, I always forget, I always will remember when Catherine Schissel first came to our office and had a meeting and explained what we're all about and what this foundation wants to do is kickstart innovative projects. And she said, I'm from Calgary and we do things boldly there and I want you guys to take risks, do bold new things and make a difference. So that was a wonderful way to engage us and that's where the partnership started. I'd also like to thank MCFD who's been a huge uh, proponent of moving things along, especially Curtis Cameron, and also the um, uh, School District 71, who will be partnering, as well as the School District in Port Hardy, and uh, the uh, Comox Valley Child Development Association, um, and many, many other different partners, Island Health as well, and Elaine Halsall. So, people often ask me when I say I'm a child psychiatrist, after the usual jokes about, do I shrink my children? Am I shrinking you at this moment? Um, what are my kids like? Do they grow up normal? Um, the next thing they often ask me is, what do you take home with you with your work? Like the hard stories you hear, do you take them home and what do you do with that? And, and the answer is, yeah, I take them home, but what I really take home is this sense of almost distress about the fact, and Dr. Perry touched on this again today, that I think children's mental health has become very good at assessment and, di and diagnosis, but in terms of treating children who have experienced trauma and neglect, I think we have a lot more to do to do effective things to help these children heal. I'm pretty good at assessing, I can label PTSD, I can talk about reactive attachment disorder, I'm actually pretty good at talking to systems like schools and uh, social workers about the impact of trauma and how this may be explaining why we're seeing a very dysregulated child. And yes, I can prescribe medicines and I can label these things, but in the end, what am I doing? So I'm often left with a, almost a sense of despair. 
Uh, Jan and I frequently get on the phone or text each other and we say, we've got another Bruce Perry child. And it's kind of like, wow, okay, but what are we going to do? What, what plan do we have in place that will actually help this child? I went into child psychiatry because my hope was to work with a very vulnerable population and to use my skills to intervene early and hopefully change the trajectory of these children's lives. Chronic mental illness, schizophrenia, that wasn't my thing. What I think medicine has become very good at is, especially primary care, is prevention and early intervention, but I don't think we're doing that in children's mental health very well. I see kids from about age three to 19, sometimes 20, 25 year olds if they're colleagues, children, like hang on to a lot of young folks when they go off to university. I really love working with teenagers, but what I often feel is the sense of frustration that if I only met them when they were infants or toddlers, I could have done a lot more for them and their families. Instead, I'm often meeting kids when they're six and they're biting their teacher at school and they're flipping desks in the classroom to the point where the teacher's evacuating the whole class and they're being, if you can imagine, in grade one at age six, prohibited from coming to school because no one knows what to do with them. Or I'm meeting them at age eight and they're violent to their siblings at home or they're attacking their moms and all of a sudden these families are looking at foster care as an option because they don't know how to handle these children. Or I'm meeting them at the age of 12 and they're bringing knives to school and I have to do a threat assessment. And I don't mean any disrespect to the school system because you know it's pretty scary. But what nobody understands is these kids are bringing knives to school because they don't feel safe. Or I'm meeting these kids at 14 and they're in the emergency room and they've overdosed because they don't know how to regulate intense emotions because they never learn the skills. Or I'm meeting them at 16, and this is my most frustrating scenario, is these are young men who are already caught up in the criminal justice system because the only thing that gives them a sense of power and what they're really good at is being criminals. So these kids are chronically misunderstood and I'm meeting them too late. One of the things I do in my job is to consult to the Behavior Resource Program, which is a fabulous uh, program in the Comox Valley where we take the most dysregulated children who are unable to function in a classroom and then we pull them out to a withdrawal acting program, which is very therapeutic. But what we're seeing with these kids is that more times than not, they have a fairly extensive history of trauma and neglect. And these are the kids who are the most dysregulated, the most dysfunctional in terms of being in a place of readiness to learn, and to be honest, the most poorly understood children. And we have a long way to go to understand them better. Uh, I think we have fairly, oh, I'll tell you a little bit about what my experience is with, with these children from the Behavior Resource Program. Uh, a typical scenario would be these kids grew up and their mom was severely depressed, or had another mental health issue and never bonded with their child, or they grew up with families where mom and dad were involved with a lot of drug and alcohol use that was beyond their control, there was a lot of violence in the relationship. They grew up in families where they might have been hurt themselves through either physical abuse or sexual abuse. But often, more often than anything else, these kids are growing up in homes where their moms or their dad are doing the best they can, but they don't have the skills to have an attuned, regulated, predictable relationship with their child because they never got parented themselves. So while we're quite good in child psychiatry in terms of diagnosing things like, and we have pretty good evidence-based treatment protocols for ADHD and for autism and for depression and for psychosis, uh, what we don't really have up until now is a good sense of how do we understand children who have experienced trauma and neglect and how do we help them heal. So I'm very excited that we have a chance to try to do it better. So through all of our partnerships um, and the support of the foundation, we put together a team. Jan and I are already calling this team our dream team. Uh, Jan Ferentz, who I like to fondly refer to as the brains of the operation, has tremendous training in Dr. Perry's model and has also had the chance to put it into practice in an inpatient residential child treatment center uh, in Calgary, the Hall Center. Um, she's also uh, been uh, working with the School District 71, the Behavior Resource Program, for several years. 
And just this week, Jan will be completing her fellowship in infant mental health at the University of California, Davis. So, tremendous knowledge and experience. Uh, Jan and I have also been able to hire two interventionists. This is the dream team. It's not us, it's them. They don't know yet. Um, <laughs> Shannon Bresch, who is the closest I can see right now, has uh, run her own preschool and she's been EA in the school system and for the last two years she's worked as a social worker at MCFD, working with the very families that we're hoping to help, doing frontline child protection work with very vulnerable families and children in vulnerable, vulnerable situations. Um, Andrew McKenzie uh, is also, oh, and I should say Shannon is completing her master's in counseling psychology, as is Andrew. Andrew McKenzie is uh, very well versed at working with children in the school system with severe behavioral dysregulation challenges, and uh, Jan has called him the child whisperer. <laughs> Extremely skilled in working with children, and I think uh, Andrew, just through his own learning and studying and research, has already been applying Dr. Parody's approaches as much as he can um, so far with us in the school system. So our team of four will be taking a cohort of children in the Comox Valley and the North, a second cohort in the North Island, probably Port Hardy and Alert Bay. And what we hope to do with very careful pre and post intervention analysis is to put into practice this model. And uh, what we'll do is assess these children and then develop tailored intervention plans based on essentially catching them up in terms of the skills and the ability to regulate that they need for their age in terms of emotional regulation, behavioral regulation, um, and just being in a place of readiness to learn at school or preschool or daycare. So what we hope to be able to do is to measure success and through that be able to show that this model is very effective and essentially develop a new uh, model of best practice. We're set our, setting our set sites quite high and we have quite lofty expectations and we hope that we'll be able to not only prove that we can help these individual children that we pick and their families, but almost as important, uh, we hope to be able to change the systems that look after these children. So the uh, social work child protection system, the educational system, the medical system, uh, criminal justice system. So through a ripple effect through individual children, we're hoping to change systems and we'll be measuring that as well. So our hope with this new model of best practice that we'll be able to show is that we'll be able to take this model, uh, show it successful, maybe be written up and published, who knows, and maybe be able to expand in terms of teaching what we know and modeling this new model of best practice in other places on Vancouver Island, the province, and after that, who knows where. So thank you very much. fortunate that the Children's Health Foundation of Vancouver Island is part of the dream team in whatever way we can. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, it's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Bruce Perry. So Dr. Perry is the Senior Fellow of the Child Trauma Academy, a nonprofit organization based in Houston. I actually wanted to adopt him as a Canadian, so encouraging him to spend more time on Vancouver Island. Um, he's the adjunct professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the Feinberg, am I saying that accurately? Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern University in Chicago, and a best-selling author who's been featured in numerous radio and television shows. So a little bit of a celebrity status based on your work, I gather. Dr. Perry spent the last 30 years actively working as a teacher, clinician, and researcher focusing on children's mental health. He spent the last 10 pioneering the neurosequential model of therapy, which is part of this project, which is a groundbreaking way of addressing child trauma. I'll leave it to Dr. Perry to explain what this is about. Clearly, you're a change maker in the lives of children everywhere. And so it's a pleasure to welcome you to Vancouver Island, Dr. Perry. Thank you very much. I, um, <clears throat> first of all, I would like to also acknowledge the traditional people of this land and pay my respects to elders past, present, and future. Um, you know, I never really know exactly what part of our work to share at any given time, and it strikes me as I hear you all talking about what you're doing here, that um, the part of our work 
I want to talk about is the part that's focused on what we call uh, appreciating the fact that we are uh, part of a long multi-generational process of social cultural evolution. You know, the, the interesting thing about uh, human beings is that we sometimes forget that we're biological creatures. We like to pretend that we're above the natural world. Uh, we, we invent lofty ideas and, and things that somehow set us apart, but the fact is human beings are, we're, we're biological creatures. We have a beginning and we have an end, and we have certain genetic gifts, just like every other species has a genetic gift, but one of the things that we have that's really unique in all of the known natural world is that we have part of our brain that is able to ex basically process information faster and store information more efficiently than any other species. So our cortex, this neocortex, is part of our brain that's involved in speech and language and abstract cognition and all these wonderful abstract ideas we have that have invented the present world. This is unique. No other, nobody else in the animal kingdom can do what we do with regards to absorbing and storing information. And what that has allowed us to do is essentially have a transient rebellion from the natural world. And so we are literally living in a state of rebellion. We are living in an artificial climate right here in this room. It's completely invented. We are not at the moment exposed to the elements outside. We will artificially prolong the day when we leave the lights on at night. We artificially invented living models. A lot of stuff we've invented have been really, really good. I mean, I, it's interesting, I think, you can look at things that we have invented and look and say, wow, that's a really good thing. I, I think reading, for example, is a pretty amazing thing. But it's an invention. English is an invention. Spanish is an invention. The nuclear family is an invention. Human beings in the natural world lived in multi-generation, multi-family groups of about 40 to 50 people. Developmental heterogeneity, the elderly and the babies and the adolescents and the youth were all in the same space. And there was continuous interaction amongst these living groups. And as we have invented the future, we've invented ourselves away from two of our greatest biological gifts. You know, grizzly bears can smell way better than we can smell. They've got the genetic gift of scent. They see about the same we do, but they can smell way better than we do. We're not very fast. We have no natural body armor. We have no poisons that we can use to protect ourselves. We literally have survived on this planet because we have formed collaborative working groups. We had hunting groups, we had foraging groups, and then we'd get these groups together and share the fruits of our activities, and that's how we survived. We survived the natural world because we had relational health. And it's one of the things that we have invented ourselves away from in the modern world. The modern world has become increasingly compartmentalized and fragmented so that we now have a million people living in the same space, but the individual is alone. You may not know anybody on your block. You get on a bus and you see people, but you don't have any connection with them. If you look at the number of real relational interactions that a typical person has now in a Western world, and you incorporate screen time, what you can easily see is that it's 1 20th of the number of relational interactions that would have been present in a primitive hunter-gatherer clan. Now the reason this is important is because as you will all learn, I hope over time, is that there is a physiologically positive benefit from having a relational interaction. When somebody smiles at you, it changes your physiology. When you feel upset and you look around and you see faces of people who are safe and familiar, it regulates you. It keeps you physiologically healthy. If you have the unavoidable adversity of life, which is going to happen, you will not get through life unscathed. Nobody does. But if you have the buffer of family, of community, of culture, it helps protect you. 
It helps physiologically regulate you. It helps give you healthy forms of reward. But if you have relational poverty, if you're isolated and disconnected and you've been the victim of transgenerational genocide and then transgenerational cultural genocide, and you live in an isolated, fragmented community, disconnected from everybody around you, disconnected from your language, disconnected from your people, guess what? You're physiologically vulnerable. Something that you would have been able to tolerate in earlier generations now drives you into a dysregulated state and you seek regulation in alcohol. You're much more likely to develop, because of this physiological dysregulation, diabetes. You're much more likely to have cardiovascular disease because of that. And the more adversity you have without relational buffer, the more you're going to have physical health problems, mental health problems, social health problems. Some of the best work ever done about this, tantalizingly powerful work that's not been widely disseminated, it was work by folks that were studying the recapturing of cultural elements in bands in different communities, First Nation communities in British Columbia. What they found was the suicide rates, physical health problems plummeted and got to Canadian norms as more and more cultural elements were recaptured by those bands. Believe it or not, learning to speak your native language, the language of your people, is a health intervention. So part of what we've learned through all this work that we've done over the years is that there are two fundamental gifts of our species that we have been broadly neglectful of. One is the importance of relational health, the importance of touch, the importance of true human interaction. And number two is the importance of early childhood. The brain develops incredibly rapidly early in life and there are these foundational things that happen as your brain organizes things that give you set points to your stress response system, things that give you set points to the way you form and maintain relationships. And these can be changed, you can modify these, but they're harder to modify the older you get. So if you have early developmental chaos and neglect without any relational buffer from a primary caregiver, you literally can have three months of that terrible early childhood experience and then be put into an environment where you have all kinds of love, attention, et cetera, et cetera, services, blah, 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 and you will still have worse outcomes than a child who had three months of high quality early childhood engagement and a good prenatal period and then was put in an environment where there's crap. That child will have a better outcome in adolescence than the kid who had that early childhood adversity. Not understanding these things is something that we have to act on as we invent the next set of systems. And that's what this is. Make no mistake about it, this project is all about inventing better ways to move forward in the next generation. You are involved in the, the invention business, you are involved in social cultural evolution, and one of the things that I would urge you to do is to look to your Native American traditions. Look to the people that live around you who are First Nations elders. To learn how they created community. What was their concept of health? It's interesting. You go into a traditional medical school in the United States and there's not a single person in there, maybe a few people, who will understand that community health factors are more predictive of individual health outcomes than your genetics. But if you talk to somebody who's from a traditional indigenous community, whether it's a Maori, whether it's Aboriginal in Australia, whether it's First Nations up here, whether it's an Apache elder, their understanding of disease is disconnection from community. You're disconnected from what, what you should be connected to. You are out of sync. You need to be pulled back in. And the amazing thing is when you look at the rituals that bring individuals back into synchrony with nature, synchrony with community, they involve the three elements that are at the core of this model. Integrating rhythm, relationship, and rationale. A reason, the story, the narrative. It, and those three things engage the lower part of the brain involved in regulation, the central part of the brain involved in forming and maintaining healthy relationships, and the top part of the brain that is basically our cognitions, our, the cognitive part of our brain. Healthy, therapeutic, experiences engage all three of those parts of your brain, usually optimally in synchrony. And again, that's a core element of traditional healing practices. Now, 
I could talk about all kind of the nuances and the fact that you know the federal government in the U.S. has a quality improvement center that's using this model and that it's being used as the primary organizing model in all of the trauma programs in, Not in Norway and that we've got you know, uh, the, the flagship sort of academic uh, child welfare organization in Australia has been using the NMT as the backbone for their uh, practice model and the Casey Family Programs, which is one of the lead sort of child welfare organizations in the U.S. is using this model as a, a core for their clinical practice model, but none of that stuff really matters. What, what really matters to you guys is that you have a community that is rich, in people who are smart, who are well-intended, and who, when they learn more about these concepts, will find that they resonate with their own observations and life experience, and then you'll have all kinds of ways that you can add meat to the skeletal elements of this program. When we design this and when we disseminate this, we did it with the intention that it is a, essentially a lens. It's a framework through which to understand problems, but that Individual communities, individual programs, individual clinicians are the ones that will add the specific meat to the bones, so to speak, and make this come alive. And every time we have had a successful integration of this approach into a, an educational setting, a juvenile justice setting, a mental health setting, we have been remarkably uh, impressed by how what we have given to those folks has essentially been improved and expanded based upon the good work and the good insights of the people who are doing this. And I fully expect that to happen in this community and I am very, very excited about what you're doing here. I, I, you know, I think the, uh, the foundation deserves a tremendous amount of credit for actually being willing to be an early adopter even though it's, there's a lot of evidence and this model's being implemented in a lot of places, it's a little bit of an innovation relative to the mainstream worldview about how to do this work. And so I give you a lot of credit for that, and uh, I wish you all of uh, all the best as you proceed with this. Just, and I hope you know that we will continue to be uh, involved in helping you stay connected to other places around the world that are learning from their experiences and we look forward to uh, harvesting your learnings and disseminating them throughout the broader network that we have all across the world. So uh, thank you for this opportunity and uh, keep up the good work and I hope to come back someday and go fishing. <laughs> thank you. Stay here and Dr. Cox, could you join us too? We just have like a small gift. I I'm so inspired by the work that you're doing. The bold leadership that you and Jan have shown in this community is to be commended. So I'm very excited for the work ahead for you. And Dr. Perry, thank you for sharing your expertise with us. And uh, please come fishing and, and uh, continue to keep an eye on all the great work that's happening here. So thank you both. So now I'm totally going off script, which is so exciting. Um, Anita, I'm going to ask you to join me up here because I just have a just a bit of discomfort with being the face of Children's Health Foundation of Vancouver Island in this moment when really the face of Children's Health <laughs> this is totally Foundation awesome. of Vancouver Island, exactly, she's so uncomfortable she could not write this part, is, is Anita Broussard in this community and so she is Children's Health Foundation of Vancouver Island in this region. She's such a valued staff member of our organization and does such great work. So I really wanted to acknowledge her and her work, and um, just so great to be standing here beside you today. Yay. So, uh, yeah. so it's our intention as a foundation, in fact, more present, more engaged in Central and North Vancouver Island. So you, you're just starting to see us in this community in a bolder way, to quote Catherine. So we're very excited. Uh, this project just blows my mind. And my heart is full and my eyes are a little bit full listening to all that's going to happen in this community. And, and you're part of that. So you are part of that. So, and you're also part of um, the RBC Foundation uh, group who are here that we're so excited. So I'm going to invite RBC Foundation, or 
Should I say foundation is actually the bank? It's really the branch, right? Um, so Colleen, Julie, and Sheena, can you come forward? So these fantastic women uh, have been volunteering here today, but they also have um, some other exciting things. And so, but what is so significant is that because Anita is situated in this community, they, these women know Anita and know her to be our representative, and that's why I really wanted Anita to be up here. Just going to take a couple of minutes uh, of uh, your time. Uh, this is our favorite time of year uh, as uh, RBC employees because we have a program that's opened up for a short period of time where we can actually proactively go out into the community and look for charities and organizations that represent uh, the values of RBC and uh, what we want to do to be able to help our, our communities prosper and thrive. And so as a result, we proactively reached out to Anita and said, is there a program that we can maybe support and come and volunteer and see what's happening and get to know a little bit more about what good work you do in the community? And she actually uh, said, yes, actually, yes, we do. So I have uh, two other of my team members, but what's so cool about this and what makes us really happy is that when we come and volunteer, uh, we bring money. <laughs> so, and that's always a good thing, right? Especially for projects. So we're happy today. Sorry, yeah. get one of my helpers here. Uh, so with us today, we brought a thousand dollars. Thank you so much. Did you get all your photo ops for that? Pretty good. Do you guys have a camera that you want to have your camera? Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. So I feel like I just want to acknowledge whether you're directly part of this project or here to just celebrate and, and be witness to it. You're part of the family here, so thank you for being here. Um, please enjoy the beverages and the food that we've brought. And I know we have a couple of youth volunteers who have some goodies to share from Children's Health Foundation that um, we'll disseminate to all of you. A little bit of chocolate, because why not? Chocolate makes everything better. So thank you for spending time with us today and celebrating the launch of this amazing project. Thank you.